Uh, I do think that the Fed has a sense uh, of what real inflation looks like, uh, a sense that's probably absent from the active from the absent the average household. And I think that the Fed is genuinely concerned about controlling those aspects of inflation that it can. Rick Rule exposes the fraudulent nature of the 2% inflation target and highlights the hidden costs affecting individuals' cost of living. He dives into the impact of government deficits, savings erosion, deflationary shocks, and the Fed's role in managing the economy. Discover the intriguing lessons from past inflation battles and the resilience of the private sector in the face of economic challenges. Gain valuable insights into real yields, the possibility of a soft landing, and the credit deserved by average American business people. Without further ado, let's step in to listen to Rick. Uh, imagine that you're a Dane, uh, and the 58% of your household income is consumed by government, yet your government continues to run a deficit. Imagine now that your savings in euro-denominated bonds are yielding you 2%, in euro, where the after-tax purchasing power of your savings is declining by 6.5% compounded. What you learn as a Dane uh, is that your savings are costing you 4.5% of purchasing power a year, and you're ignoring the largest single factor in the depreciation of your purchasing power, which is to say increased uh, uh, taxation. I'm not saying this merely as a political statement, Kai, although I do like to propagandize. I, I'm saying this because people pay attention to easy to grasp headline statistics like a 2% inflation target. The problem with a 2% inflation target is that the measurement matrix that people are, are accepting is fraudulent. I think that the policy response to a deflationary shock <laughs> would be quantitative easing and government borrowing, which is to say, ironically, the policy response to deflation would be extremely inflationary. Uh, again, we saw that uh, in the mid-1970s. In the mid-1970s, we decided to raise interest rates further to combat inflation. Uh, that resolve lasted uh, a sum total of nine months, if my memory serves me well. <laughs> before the political powers and, frankly, the voters uh, decided to return to a policy of free beer and a free lunch, which couldn't last. Due to the markets. Uh, thus far, the economy has been strong enough that the economy has weathered the rate hikes. Now, let me be very clear, Kai. Uh, I wish there were no more Fed meetings, ever. Uh, and I don't expect them to accomplish, at least on purpose, anything good. Uh, I think that you're in a managed economy, and I think an unmanaged economy would be better for all concerned, albeit more volatile. Uh, I do think that the Fed has a sense uh, of what real inflation looks like, uh, a sense that's probably absent from the active, from the absent, the average household. And I think that the Fed is genuinely concerned about controlling those aspects of inflation that it can. If that's true, given the relative strength in the U.S. economy and the incredible strength in the bond market with negative real yields and the relative strength in the equities markets, I think that they have the opportunity for a 25 basis point increase. And I think that they will uh, probably take it. Uh, I, I know certainly if I were them, uh, I would take it. Uh, and I need to say, whether on purpose or not, that the Fed has done a relatively elegant job uh, in the last two years, uh, engineering uh, higher nominal interest rates, uh, albeit not real uh, interest rates yet, uh, while relying on the strength of the private economy uh, to finance the sins of the collectivist economy. I'm uh, incredibly impressed, uh, and I'm sure that no real credit goes either to the Fed or Congress, 
But I'm incredibly impressed with the way that the U.S. economy in particular uh, has dealt with a higher cost of borrowing in, a, in an over-leveraged economy. Uh, you know, it, it could be, stranger things have happened, that they could engineer a soft landing. Uh, it could be that they could bring the expectation of inflation, at least inflation by their measure, down to 3%, while maintaining uh, a 5% uh, yield on U.S. one-year treasuries, which is to say that they may actually be successful in generating a, a positive real yield if the economy can hold in. Uh, and I think that would be a major accomplishment. Uh, I, I'm not sure whether, well, I am sure. I don't think they get the credit. Uh, I think average American business people uh, and uh, average American workers who generate utility in a real economy uh, get the credit. Uh, I think the Fed and the government continue to get what they deserve, which is to say the blame. But I am, and this is going to sound like an American, American centric comment, I don't mean it to. I think that the creativity and tenacity of the private sector means that individually we create so much value that we can usually finance our collective stupidity. Uh, and this is another lesson of that. And it's very impressive. Uh, I'm amazed now at the ingenuity that's beginning to be displayed in Africa, uh, you know, a place that people had written off. This sort of uh, technology revolution, the startup revolution in Africa, this guy, Don Gote, who's revolutionized the uh, sugar industry in Nigeria, then the cement industry, uh, now the oil refining industry. Uh, it, it's almost like one guy uh, can create light uh, in a country, Nigeria, where so much wealth has been wasted and stolen <laughs> by the government that one of the richest nations in the world is bankrupt. Uh, it, it, this juxtaposition between what he has been able to accomplish, uh, albeit in league with the kleptocrats who run the country, uh, it, it, it's just amazing the juxtaposition between private accomplishment and public, uh, how would you call it, destruction. I don't own gold for a move from 1950 to 2075. Uh, I own gold to preserve my wealth. Uh, ironically, Kai, and your listeners are going to hate this because they're young and aggressive and all these kind of things. And they're, you know, they're trying to make their car payments and stuff like that. Um, I own a lot of gold and I kind of hope the price doesn't go up. Uh, for me, uh, precious metals are uh, catastrophe insurance. And I just assume not have a catastrophe. I, I, I hope when I shed my mortal coil, however I am, however old I am, that I look back and say, you know, owning all that gold uh, was a waste. But it allows me to sleep nights and stay calm. Uh, I guess as a consequence of that orientation, I'm much less time sensitive. Uh, I own gold and silver, and I own most equities uh, with a five-year term or a 10-year term. It's odd now that I'm 70 years of age uh, and I have less time on earth that I've become much more patient. Uh, when I was 21 or 22, I sort of thought that what happened over the next two or three months was relevant. But it's so impossible to forecast, uh, and the moves that you can enjoy in two or three months are so small that they really aren't relevant. Uh, Five-year time frames, six-year time frames, ten-year time frames are very relevant. When I and we've discussed this before on your show, Kai, when I look back at the speculative moves that have really made a difference to me, uh, the ten baggers, the fifteen baggers, the twenty baggers, characteristically, they took five or six years to work out. I may have wanted them to take place in a quarter, but what I wanted is irrelevant. Why well, want what you can't have? They did take five or six years. And by the way, almost every 10 bagger I ever enjoyed delivered me a 50% share price decline sometime during my holding period. So in addition, in addition to being patient, you have to be persistent. And people who pay too much attention to the Fed and not enough attention to the underlying investment attributes and people whose time horizons are, are inconsistent 
with the time demands to achieve the investment outcomes that they're trying to cause to occur are doomed to failure. If you have a three month orientation uh, in what is a six or seven year cycle, you will snatch defeat from the jaws of victory just because your investment orientation is out of sync with what is required uh, to experience the outcome that you're hoping for. It's very perverse.